All right, this is um, actually a final material presentation um, about ceramics. And I'm not talking about ceramics as in cups and figurines, but um, bricks, concrete, glass, and more. Ceramics are generally hard and brittle. Um, great compression strength, but no flexing if that yields strength. Um, they don't creep. And we're looking at um, bricks and concrete and glass um, and some other engineering ceramics. Diamonds are also ceramics, by the way, classified that way, which are simply very compressed carbon, um, the element of carbon. Okay, start with bricks. Um, there's a lot of regional varieties, a lot of cultural stuff. They've been around for a long time. You can mix clay and straw. Straw kind of adds a grain, which you've seen as a part of just about everything we work with. Um, you dry it out either by firing it. Um, that still happens. It's still The modern method is still mixing clay and silica and some elements out of Portland cement, which I'll be talking about in a minute, and again, drying them in kilns, um, and there's um, the molding and um, pressing, getting them together. There's a video that shows kind of an interesting machine making bricks, and you should note that the brick is made in one long tube and then cut um, with a wire, you might have to watch the video replay it a little bit to see it. And you will also notice on that video that um, the outside bricks are um, peeled off. They're, they're not used out of that long tube. That's called... Um, that excess stuff on the side is called cullet. That's going to play a part in um, making of glass, which I'll explain in a minute. But there's always a, the outside part is cut off of that so that um, what's left is all good quality material and not something that has an um, imperfection on the end. And um, that cullet also has a particular use which we'll get to in a minute and when you watch this particular video on brick making with the machine moving the bricks around think not so much about the bricks but the machine doing that kind of job um, a lot of industries have unique machinery you don't go down to machines R us and buy a brick sorting um, contraption the company builds it themselves and it is not unusual for an industrial technology graduate to be involved in the design team for those kind of one-of-a-kind machinery making so think about not so much making the brick but making the machine okay mortar is the stuff that holds the bricks or stones if you're doing stonework together um, It's been around for a long time. Gypsums use gypsum and mud. Now they use a thing called lime mortar. Um, or not now, but they did for quite a long time. So a lot of the buildings will still have this in it. But they mixed limestone and sand. And um, what was left was calcium carbonate that hardened up. Now a lot of mortar mixtures use this Portland cement. Um, and I'm gonna, that comes into play later. It is a mixture of um, various elements that has some very interesting properties. But keep in mind that mortar is what holds bricks and stones together. Um, and we're going to see that it's different from other materials.
And this, of course, is the bricks um, being laid in and the mortar that holds them together. And um, just so you are aware, the, the picture on the right shows the completed building with bricks laid together. And the you notice that there's a groove in that mortar. There's many ways you can make grooves in that mortar, and that is a, 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 making that groove or curve or V or there's a couple other things that could be made, shapes that could be made into that, um, is a necessary part for finishing that construction. Um, leaving it rough, like it says on the left, would have problems with being a water barrier. And remember, this kind of brick is often uh, not so much around here, more into stucco, but um, it is, in a lot of parts of the country, a common exterior um, for a house, for residences. And this is a, um, it's to protect the wood of the house. The house is actually structurally made out of wood which you saw, but then covered with the bricks. Okay, cement. Now, it's the mixture of lots of several oxides and calcium silicates, and it's the powder. It's the um, very interesting mixture that was developed in the 18 mid 1800s, late 1800s, um, and they figured out how to take a lot of these particular oxides, aluminum oxide, iron oxides, um, and mix them together and heat them up and make this powder that is essentially dehydrated rock. You add water to it, chemical reaction takes place, and then you have artificial rock. Now, that's the that's cement. By weight, bricks and cement are some of the largest industrial materials out there that are in use because there's just so much of it and they're so darn heavy. But cement by itself is fairly fragile. You have to do one other thing to make something useful. And that is to make concrete, you take the um, cement and add to it real stones. And that stone is called an aggregate, it's a rock. Um, when next you are on campus in the Industrial Technology Building, walk up the stairs um, by the elevator and look at the floor, and you will see some of the cement has broken off and you can see rocks in the stairways. That's because the, all the concrete in the building, the outside of it is the cement, but just underneath the surface is a bunch of rocks. And those rocks are there, they're especially processed um, to provide a lot of the strength. Now, the cement and even the concrete has no tensile strength, so it won't flex. So you have to reinforce these concrete structures or roadways or um, wherever you're going to use concrete. You have to reinforce it with steel bars called rebar. And there's a couple of examples of rebar. Um, that area they're standing in will be filled with concrete and a lot of the, the material in there is going to be steel. Those round ones would end up being used um, in vertical applications. We stood up on end and a um, post in the middle of a building would be poured around it. In that case the a frame is built around that 
one of those structures out of wood and then the concrete is poured in and then the wood is removed and you only have concrete left. If you go back to our building and look at the walls of our building, you will notice that they look they're very rough. Well, that's because the um, the framing for the uh, for the molds that they were gonna the, pour the concrete in, they made those exterior parts out of um, redwood planks, poured the concrete, then removed the concrete planks, and what was left was the an image of the redwood planks and that's what looks like it's almost like it's made out of wood and then they went and painted it that got awful puke pink crap color you know if they'd have painted it brown or a little bit brownish color it would look like a wooden building even though it's all concrete now I mentioned this because um, I've, and I've said it in that I Students out of this class need to have a little savvy when they go into a lumber yard or hardware store, home improvement store. Um, if you go in to build a backyard barbecue and you're going to use bricks, you want mortar mix. You don't want to get Portland cement. You don't want to get um, concrete mix. The concrete mix over on the right is Portland cement with aggregate added to it with rocks mixed in there um, and so you would um, buy that mix it up in a bucket or wheelbarrow and um, then pour that material into where you need it to go okay shifting to another ceramic um, glass is considered an amorphous non-crystalline solid <laughs> um, it's transparent mostly although you can tint it um, it's chemically and electrically um, resistant the insulators on heavy-duty power lines um, often have glass caps to as insulators um, for whatever joints there might be um, because it's a great electrical insulator. Most of the um, glass was first developed many many years ago it was mostly sand basically melting sand and that's called silicate glass. Um, in a minute a little bit about the cathedrals in Europe and the glass made for the windows in those cathedrals. Modern glass is, um, and container glass is mostly what's called soda lime glass. You still get a lot, of, you still have sand because it's, there's still silica in there, but you have other ox, um, oxides and carbonates. There's a good video explaining this, how they make window glass. Um, Silicon dioxide, lime, um, sulfate, and look at that, 2% of cullet, broken glass. The process heats up um, a lot better, and it, the, the cooking process for this um, goes better if you've got like a starter of having a little glass already in there, then the other materials mix together much quicker. Um, for making flat glass, like window panes, you heat this material up and pour it over a um, pool of molten tin. And the tin, as a liquid, stays perfectly flat, and the glass that's slowly poured over it stays flat, and the tin allows it to cool a little bit, pulls a little of the heat away, and it gets to the other end of the production line and it's pulled off as solid glass. Again, a video on that. Um, a glass operation has to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. These places will not 
turn off until uh, maybe once every 10 years for serious maintenance. But once you get this process started of making glass, you cannot stop um, because it's so hard to restart. It takes months to get back up into production. Um, so they run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including the bottle making process. Um, and so you can imagine there are not a lot of people making glass bottles, but they're making them all the time. If you ever get a chance to look at the glass bottle manufacturing operation in Modesto for E&J Gallo, you will be fascinated with the process that they're doing. Um, you unfortunately did not get a chance to do the blow molder in our lab, but had you been able to do that, you would have been able to see what it's like. Um, but I think I've got a video on it. You can do some other things, and there's a lot being done with glass these days. You can add color, you can put lead in it to make it not susceptible to x rays. You could do all kinds of stuff. Um, the glass used in cell phones and tablets is a little bit different. Um, it's been around since the 1960s, and um, then alumino silicate um, stuff. The touch, the, the ability to do the touch screen part uses some other, some rare earth elements, um, and it's a continuing evolving um, technology. And just one other thing about glass dimension is that the winch, your windshield is made out of a laminate glass. Um, in between the, uh, actually several layers, but think of it as um, a piece of plastic wrap with glass on both sides. Purpose for that is that if you have, are in an accident, the glass doesn't shatter in the same way a normal window pane does. It um, sticks together and almost dents and shatters in, in different ways but doesn't fly apart. Um, some people have speculated and you can't really, it's really hard to test this because it is something that happens so slowly it's, it's, it's impossible to properly document, but it does give you a little bit of an idea of something if this is true. Um, if glass is, is a really very viscous liquid, flows but so slowly that it, um, you measure any flow of it in eons, not decades or centuries, but um, many centuries. And I want to bring up a unit of measure, poise, that has to do with viscosity. Um, viscosity is what you measure with oil, it's what you measure with ink, um, it's how much it flows. And it's measured by a unit of poise. And purified water at sea level has a poise of 0.1 and everything is, is referenced off of that. So it's another unit of measure. Um, and it's, it's a reference base ones. Now the, we're now 500 years from when the big cathedrals were built in Europe and the glass that they made at the time was simply molten sand slapped out over a, a rock and, um, then put into position. One of the reasons the stained glass windows are lots of little pieces is because it was very hard to make one giant piece of glass with this method. And if this idea that glass is just a very, very slow moving liquid, those pieces of glass have been standing upright for 500 and more years. Um, and the 
glass all had air bubbles in it. You know, this is not a very sophisticated method of making glass. So as the glass tends to move down a little bit and become pear-shaped um, in its position sitting there for 500 years, and the air bubbles have very slowly moved up towards the top, the two things have happened. One is that those um, pieces of glass are, break very easily. High winds now are breaking and storms are breaking the glass in these big cathedrals. And with that change over the years, the colors are different. And the people who are putting in and replacing this glass are faced with a challenge. Do they make the new glass, it will not have air bubbles and will not flow, in a way that duplicates what they think would have been the original color, or do they do it based on the color that it is before it was replaced because those two colors are very different and so the technologist is is challenged if they make these stained glasses look like they would have in the 15th century all the little old ladies are going to complain oh that window doesn't look like it was when i was a little girl um They have the ability to make it look like it did 20 or 30 years ago. Um, which do you choose? The original or the one that everybody is familiar with, alive is familiar with? So, technology and art do intersect occasionally. All right, a couple more ceramics. One important one is carbon graphite. It has several applications. One is um, for bearings. One is for brushes for motors. A brush in a motor is that device that takes the electricity and transfers it to a revolving part of the motor. That, as that motor spins around, that north-south pole has to have electricity switched every half revolution, and that's done through brushes that contact what's called the commutator particularly in large high voltage motors. The part that actually makes that connection and is moving are made out of carbon graphite. They're called brushes even though they're solid pieces. Um, spring loaded and then the electricity is applied through it and then they'll spin around. These um, it's a very important for particularly heavy duty motors at 440 volt big motors. Your motor for your little hand drill uses what's called precious metal brushes and they're, it's a little bit different. Um, these carbon graphite is also used for those electrodes in the electric arc furnace. If you go back to the metal videos and look at the big giant red hot parts that were making it um, melting the metal, you will find that they are um, those are gar carbon graphite electrodes. Now we've got some engineering ceramics. Um, they're used for cutting tools, for lathes and milling machines. Those are the inserts that are that you see in the modern machinery. Um, and there's some other uses. And one way to get a handle on them, I'm, I'm going to go through very quickly. Here's what these ceramic grains look like, and um, while I think I borrowed these images off of some website, I have actually taken some um, samples of both silicon carbide and aluminum oxide and looked at them under our microscope, and this is very much what they look like. And I'm going to discuss coated abrasives because it's a good way to understand um, how some applications and the most common application for um, modern engineering um, ceramics. And that abrasive, a coated abrasive sandpaper, has the abrasive itself, the backing, and how it is adhered to that backing. 
The same is true of grinding wheels, um, just that it's compacted like a sugar cube. You have two different types you have of, of sandpaper. You have open coat and closed coat, and that depends on whether the grains are close to each other or spaced a little bit further apart. Now, the reason you do this is because um, the open coat, you think, gosh, I'm not getting as much for my money. Um, there's less little abrasives there. Um, well, if depending on what you're going to be sanding, you may need extra space in between those grains. Um, you can imagine the closed coat would be good for metal because not taking big chunks off, whereas the open coat is useful for sanding on wood because the sawdust um, is bigger and can plug up a um, piece of sandpaper very easily, but it's hard to do with a closed coat. The um, adhesive or the bonding can depend on whether you're going to use it with water um, or whether it's going to always be dry. Lots of things that can be um, measured with this um, in the backing too. If it's plastic with a good adhesive, it can be done underwater, um, but not so much if it's paper and a thin adhesive. You'll also notice that those grains are pointing straight up. That's actually um, how they make sandpaper these days. They apply the grains with an electrical static charge that causes them to point their sharpest end upward. And here's um, some applications. The very obvious one is that see the aluminum oxide open coat is good for hard and soft wood but not recommended for metals and the closed coat is okay for the metals but not really recommended or does a, only a fair job on hardwoods but not recommended for softwoods. Um, silicon carbides can be used across the way but that open and closed coat would fit um, in, in the same category. So um, different um, ceramics for different applications. Finally, to talk about um, coated abrasives, you have to think about grit size. And the most common definition of them in the U.S., um, well, it's either the FEPA or the CAMI, they're essentially the same. Um, but it has to do with the, used to be that the grains of like garnet, which was actually a, a natural rock, were filtered to make sandpaper by mesh screens, like a window screen. And how many, how big the gap was with that mesh would determine how big the, um, sand was going to be and so the measurement of that opening in that window screen um, and how many cross threads you have on it per foot or whatever um, indicated how many um, how tight your your where your rock was so the larger the number the smaller the grain size of this, the uh, material, meaning it's a much finer sandpaper. The big numbers um, indicate um, that it's small. A small number, like 24 or 30, um, indicate a pretty big particle size for the grit. So it's a reverse standardization system. Okay, there's a few terms, and that's it on um, ceramics. Watch the videos.